rally the German people toward victory and revenge. Joseph Goebbels coins these terms, Vengeance 1 and Vengeance 2, and the idea was that they would be effective uh, to counter the American air offensive and the British air offensive. The Vengeance 1, or V-1, is a revolutionary liquid-fueled pulse jet capable of flying 360 miles an hour on autopilot. Launched from ski ramps or from beneath a flying aircraft, the V-1 bursts into action. A sophisticated gyro compass feedback system guides it toward its target. The V-1 gets nicknamed the buzz bomb for the loud noise its jet engine creates. An odometer tracks its pre-programmed distance, at which point the V-1 is designed to take a steep power dive. But in early use, the dive cuts off fuel flow and kills the engine. Sudden silence becomes a tip-off to impending doom. Of the 8,000 bombs launched, 2,300 penetrated British defenses, most of them falling in the London vicinity. The propulsion roar of the flying bomb... The world's first cruise missile rains fire and ash on Britain in 1944 and 45, terrorizing London with thousands killed and tens of thousands injured. Hundreds of homes, hospitals and public buildings were hit. They fell in crowded streets during rush traffic hours. But new deep shelters built for this emergency were put to use and saved the lives of thousands of people. Only one life was lost for every three bombs launched. Few of the robot bombs resulted in fire, but the great concussive blasts of vengeance weapon number one exceeded anything London had experienced. Part technological masterpiece, part military triumph. Hitler's secret science is paying off. But there's one big problem with the Big Bang. Accuracy. To target and destroy Allied bases with troops and convoys, somebody would have to fly this bomb. While Hitler promises the nation that his rockets will turn the war, Engineers add a pilot seat and crude controls to the V-1, creating the Reichenberg, a German kamikaze aircraft. Hundreds were built, but none ever see combat. They were difficult to fly. Putting a pilot would have ensured some small amounts of damage, but the potential of the airplane in terms of its top speed, of its range and its endurance, of its ability to get to a target, these were not essential war-winning weapons. Decades later, the original plans for the Reichenberg resurface in a private archive. In this small Bavarian garage, Hitler's secret science is coming back to life as several wonder weapons are rebuilt or reconstructed here for museums. The Bavarian builders find welded seams of inconsistent quality, suggesting that some were done by skilled technicians others by exhausted concentration camp prisoners. This restored relic is still capable of flight. All it lacks is the volunteer to fly it. For Hitler's secret scientists, no concept is too futuristic. No propulsion system or wing design too bizarre. Some will fly, some will fail. Many live on in the war zones of the 21st century. And in a strange twist of history, one of Hitler's most brilliant scientists will survive the fall of the Third Reich to become an American hero. 1943, Germany's National Socialist Party announces vengeance weapon V-1, suggesting that a V-2 is also planned. So from the Nazi secret complex at Peenemunde, engineers give birth to the space age from the ground up, 
via a brilliant young physicist, Dr. Werner von Braun, and his A-4 rocket, ultimately named the V-2. The V-2, the vengeance weapon. To Werner von Braun, uh, it was an artillery piece that would land somewhere in England and kill some Englishmen, but that was really not his point. His point was proving the aerodynamics, the power, the thrust, the cooling, all of the things necessary to take him one more step into space. He wanted to see man in space. It was a consuming passion. His engineering ideas were what drove him. Von Braun is given his own laboratory and team of experts at a time when rocketry is little more than a schoolboy hobby in the United States. Ultimately, he creates the world's first long-range ballistic missile, the unstoppable V-2 retaliation rocket. In September of that same year, 1944, the Germans also began their firings of the vastly superior V-2, which was powered by a real liquid fuel engine. Military rockets in a rudimentary form had been used for centuries, but their propulsion was by the use of gunpowder. In this new era, it was the Germans who realized that the liquid fuel rocket could be put to military use. That it could be given impressive range and great destructive power. The German focus on advanced technology completely changes the capabilities of science and warfare. They not only took a toll of more than 9,000 casualties, they also had a devastating psychological effect. For unlike the buzz bomb, the V-2 fell without warning. It had a speed of 3,300 miles per hour, and it could not be intercepted by fighter aircraft or brought down by anti-aircraft artillery. According to Boyne, von Braun's focus was more on the science than winning the war. All that mattered to him was solving the aerodynamic problems, the problems of control, the problems of uh, uh, burn, of all of the things that are inherent in a ballistic missile, not as a weapon, but as a means to get into space. But defiance of the Fuhrer is not an option for any German scientist. And neither is the suggestion of defense. The real impact on the outcome of the war was in a, an area that the Germans really failed to develop, and that was really the defense of technologies. You had to be very politically correct as a Nazi or else you'd be in trouble. That meant you couldn't have weapons that were seen to be too defensive that might indicate that the war was being lost. But the truth for Germany was that the war was being lost. 1944, U.S. warplanes attack a Nazi convoy of trucks carrying the one wonder weapon that might have made a difference had it ever been deployed. The Typhoon, the world's first defensive ground-to-air missile, designed to augment Nazi efforts to shoot down Allied bombers. The one thing that Germany could have done by 1943, if they had properly concentrated their resources, was to concentrate not on a, a V-2 to hit Great Britain, but on a series of anti-aircraft missiles uh, to knock down any bomber that comes over it. So they could have created an effective integrated air defense system. Typhoon's first field tests were conducted at Station 4 in Peinemunde in 1944. It's revolutionary and economical. 